I am welcoming Dr. Wee Yang, who's a press professor at the University of Calgary, and he co-leads the Hotchkiss Brain Institute Multiple Sclerosis Brain and Mental Health Team. He also directs our Alberta MS Network. He is the past president of the International Society for Neuroimmunology, and his research has been published over 300 times, cited by many researchers around the world, and has led to several clinical trials for people living with MS, as well as spinal cord injury and glioblastoma. His work is very well regarded around the world. And tonight he is here to share with you some new research developments in multiple sclerosis. So please, we go ahead. Thank you, Trisha. And thank you all for your attendance. Trisha, can you hear me well? Um, I presume you, all of you can hear me well, okay? Yes, Very I good. can hear you well, go ahead. Excellent, uh, thank you. Uh, so today I thought I'll bring a presentation that will last about 45 minutes or so to give us uh, enough time for Q&A at the end. Um, and my intent today is to emphasize that there has been a lot of progress occurring on MS around the world in terms of our understanding and how to treat MS. I'm going to begin with this schematic that shows the players that are involved in MS. I'm going to orient you first to the brain and the spinal cord also referred to as the central nervous system. And within the brain and spinal cord, we have these nerve cells called neurons. And here I show you one neuron communicating with another neuron. And we have billions of this in our brain and spinal cord. Many of them communicate with one another and to the rest of the body. In order for communication to occur from one neuron to the next, there is a signal that is transmitted down this nerve fiber, also called axon, and then this then sets off a chain of event in the next one. In our body, some of these axons or nerve fibers are very long. In the spinal cord, they can be over a meter in length, for instance. And so we need mechanisms to speed up that conduction of signal. And that's enabled by this wrapping called myelin around nerve fibers. Myelin itself is made from this cell type called oligodendrocyte. And it is this combination of oligodendrocyte and the myelin that it makes that allows this rapid transmission of impulses. And then over here in the bloodstream, we have immune cells. We have many types of immune cells. They circulate in the bloodstream. Some of them, very few of them, make their way into the brain and spinal cord because they are normally kept out by this blood-brain barrier. Some of them do enter because immune cells are needed to help survey the brain and spinal cord. Immune cells are very important for us. They help us fight infections, gut against any possible infections and the like. So these are the players in MS. And we'll see that in MS, these immune cells or some populations of immune cells become overactivated. They gain the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier in large numbers, and they begin to wreak havoc in the central nervous system so that the communication within the brain and spinal cord and with the rest of the body becomes impaired, depending on which part of the brain and spinal cord is involved. So these are the players in multiple sclerosis. We can actually find these immune cells here, for instance, in a case in an MS brain donated uh, at uh, passing. And we can see that um, here we have detected a blood vessel label in red, immune cells are coming out of the blood vessel and entering into the brain pop proper in large numbers, where they begin to help destroy the elements within the brain and spinal cord. So again, another schematic, just so that we all leave this lecture 
with a good appreciation of what MS is about. In the bloodstream, we have these immune cells of different types. They are normally kept out of the brain and spinal cord by the blood, by the blood brain barrier. Some of these immune cells do enter to patrol, and this is the healthy situation. In multiple sclerosis, there is excessive activation of populations of immune cells, and now they begin to produce substances that break down the blood brain barrier and they enter into the CNS, the brain and spinal cord, where they begin to inflict injury. And over time, elements, in this case, the neuron and its nerve fiber uh, disappears because they have been destroyed. Yet another rendition, just to highlight one neuron um, and its nerve fiber, and another neuron and its nerve fiber. Here's an oligodendrocyte that is forming those myelin wrappings, insulation, if you like, along the wire. Uh, the healthy situation in multiple sclerosis, because of the influx of immune cells into the central nervous system, the oligodendrocyte dies, and therefore the myelin that it makes is now lost. And over time as well, unfortunately, the nerve cell also disappears. And it is the disappearance of the nerve cell that is most associated with the progression of disability that one finds in an individual with MS. So that then is the pathology of multiple sclerosis. And here's a cartoon from my colleague at the Cleveland Clinic just to highlight for us why myelin is so important. So a nerve fiber, it's going to be conducting that signal that goes down that nerve fiber. And here's that same nerve fiber, but this time it has the myelin wrapping around it and the conduction of impulse is that much quicker. So we see this example of a nerve fiber that does not have myelin on it, in comparison, a nerve fiber with myelin around it conducts impulses and signal very, very quickly. And so when we lose myelin, we, when we lose oligodendrocyte and the myelin that it makes, there is going to be consequence on the central nervous system. That's why we need myelin. So with that, then, we have clinical forms of multiple sclerosis that some of you are likely very familiar with the relapsing remitting form, most common form in which there is a relapse, then there is remission, another relapse, remission, followed by another relapse, and this is relapsing remitting MS. In many individuals over the course of time, eventually there is steady progression of disability after an initial phase of relapses, and so that's this is called secondary progressive MS. In a few individuals, there is steady progression of disability from onset, and this is called primary progressive MS. Sometimes there is one episode and one event um, not yet diagnosed formally with MS, and this is called clinically isolated syndrome. And what is very clear now is that events are already occurring in the brain and spinal cord prior to the first appearance of symptoms in any of these clinical causes. These events can be detected in the form of MRI, even before the diagnosis of MS, but they can also be detected clinically as well. So this is the phenomenon of MS prodrome. And a leader in this field is Helen Tramlett, based at the University of British Columbia, and also Ruth and Marie, based at the University of Manitoba. And here they have published that uh, a paper, and that's the title of the, that paper that they published. But basically, the take home message from that study is that in the five years leading up to symptoms and the diagnosis of MS, Individuals were already making more frequent use of the healthcare system than the match uh, general population controls. 
So basically, even prior to first appearance of a symptom reminiscent of MS, there are already a lot of things brewing, particularly within the brain and spinal cord of an individual that subsequently succumbed to MS. This is now called the MS prodrome. And one important implication of diagnosing the MS prodrome is that if this can be reliably identified, we may be able to then treat individuals at risk early so as to prevent their evolution into multiple sclerosis. This would be in the context of preventing MS if one were able to diagnose, identify MS prodrome much earlier on. And this is a very active area of investigation. So with MS as an immune-mediated disorder in which immune cells in the bloodstream that I showed you become activated and enter into the brain and spinal cord, we now have many medications directed towards taming, uh, subduing the overactive immune system. And these are called immunomodulators or disease-modifying therapies. And this slide shows you the advent of these medications. The first, the first FDA-approved medication is this uh, molecule, also called inter, uh, beta-seron, that was introduced in 1993. It is an interferon beta. Uh, and subsequently, soon after, there were other forms of interferon beta. Uh, but you can see that over this span, there were some medications that began to be approved by the FDA for use in MS. And then more recently, we now have this crop going from 2010, and I've cut this off at 2021, of a variety of medications that are now available as disease-modifying therapies for individuals living with MS. So this is a very active area of progress, and we will see more medications being approved um, because many of these are in ongoing, in definitive ongoing clinical trials. So this then is substantial progress in the area of uh, multiple sclerosis. Many of these medications are for the relapsing remitting form of MS, but some of these are also approved for forms of secondary progressive MS as well. These medications have proven to be very useful by virtue of data that show that they reduce the frequency of relapses, the severity of relapses. But in this slide, the data shows that the conversion to secondary progressive MS from a relapsing remitting initial cause is also slowed by these MS medications. So each of these blurb is an individual. So this is a study involving many, many individuals of when they progress into secondary progressive MS. Individuals that were not treated on this line, but if they were treated with this initial MS disease-modifying therapies, the very early ones, uh, that already shows this um, slowing of progression into secondary progressive MS. We now have more active um, and potent medications, uh, and the graph looks even more impressive in terms of preventing transition into secondary progressive MS. So we are making progress there. But for those individuals already diagnosed with progressive MS, so what do we do? Well, this is a slide to tell you that there is a, a, a website, a public site called clinicaltrials.gov. One can go into this slide, type in multiple sclerosis, and look at the trials that are ongoing or have um, been completed recently. And so I did this uh, just a few days ago, uh, typing in progressive multiple sclerosis, and I came up with the 259 studies that are ongoing around the world. Here are some of the medications that are in trials in 
was in secondary as well as primary progressive MS. And this is just to emphasize that treatments for progressive MS is very, very much a desired goal for the community. This is a very active area of research uh, and we expect more and more progress uh, to be made in this area to treat progressive MS. Locally here at the University of Calgary, we have also been involved in clinical trials. This is one example in primary progressive MS. And here I acknowledge the work of my neurology colleague, Dr. Marcus Koch, who led this study of a generic medication called hydroxychloroquine. This is an anti-malaria medication. We found that this medication could affect some of the bulging relevant to progressive MS. So this was brought into a clinical trial in primary progressive MS by Dr. Marcus Koch. It involved 35 patients. So this is a relatively small study, 35 patients, all with primary progressive MS. And we are looking at their progression of disability from month six to 18 of treatment. So in this study, these are the patients that uh, progress in disability, but here are the individuals that did not progress over that period of time. The expected number of patients to progress in worsening of disability was 40%, and with hydroxychloroquine, the odds of progression was half. So this is a step in the right direction this work is being taken up by a United Kingdom group uh, with the plan to go into a larger phase three definitive trial of hydroxychloroquine in primary progressive MS. Hydroxychloroquine is a generic medication. It has been around for many years. It costs actually about 50 cents a pill uh, in comparison to current MS disease modifying therapies that typically would be in the hundreds of dollars per pill. So we are quite excited about this uh, and hopefully this will all pan out in the future. But again, it is, we hope, we think moving in the right direction. Yet another area of advance is in the neuropathology. What is happening within the brain and the spinal cord of individuals living with MS. So there has been a dogma around for some time that in the early stage of multiple sclerosis, one is dealing with a particular type of inflammation where immune cells come in from the bloodstream into the brain and spinal cord. And that later on, we are then dealing with immune cells or cells that are local within the brain and spinal cord. Uh, this would be what is referred to as compartmentalized CNS inflammation, where the inflammation is resident within the brain and spinal cord. So the dogma was that we have this type of lesion early on, and then this type of lesion then follows. And associated with that would be increasing disability. MS was considered a two-stage disease in terms of its neuropathology. But these days, we recognize that everything is intermingled. That very early on, while we have these immune cells that are coming into the brain and spinal cord in large numbers, we also already have the immune cells and other cell types within the brain and spinal cord providing injury, that the CNS compartmentalized inflammation is already robust very early on. So everything is intermingled, that it's no longer a two-stage, but we need to consider the amalgamation of all of these events occurring in the central nervous system all at once. Now. Um, the implication of that, I'm going to explain uh, shortly. But here, I wish to acknowledge my youngest daughter, Heather Young, 
She is a neurology resident here at the University of Calgary. And she and I wrote this review on the types of lesions that one encounters in the brain of an individual with multiple sclerosis. Here is the typical lesion in which immune cells are coming across the blood vessel into the brain and spinal cord to produce injury. But there are other types of uh, injury as well. There are those uh, located here, causing underlying brain injury. There's this compartmentalized CNS inflammation that becomes more and more widespread, but initiating very early on. And then there are other types of lesions such as this, and our emphasis is that all of these lesions are seen across the spectrum. They're seen early, they're seen late. It is just a matter of numbers that early on, we may have more of these initiating from the bloodstream, but already early on, we also have these CNS initiated inflammation, but that as the disease progresses, we have more of this type, including this compartmentalized microglia activation. And here our uh, emphasis was that we cannot consider MS as uh, a condition with distinct phases of inflammation or injury producing mechanisms, but all of these are intermingled, but there tends to be more of one type earlier on uh, and more of another type earlier on. Yes, but everything is intermingled um, and, and they all help to drive the neuropathology of MS. So one implication of that um, has resulted in this um, expert opinion piece. I am uh, honored to be a member of this team on behalf of the International Advisory Committee on Clinical Trials in multiple sclerosis. Uh, many of these are uh, individuals, many of my colleagues here are leaders in the field, uh, and we came together to provide this opinion piece in order to help the FDA, the pharmaceutical companies, um, and, and other um, uh, relevant organizations to rethink um, how to treat multiple sclerosis. And basically, uh, we emphasize that we need to identify and treat the predominant type of lesions that are driving worsening in an individual at any given time. In other words, um, recognizing that many types of lesions are occurring, some more earlier on, some more later on, but with variation across individuals, we need to be able to define the type of lesion that is driving the disability on an individual basis uh, and therefore to use medications appropriately. This also has relevance to clinical trials where we would like to be able to identify populations with predominant type of particular types of lesion for certain selected medications versus another group of MS individuals with a predominant different type of lesion and to treat that with medications that are more suited towards that type of lesion. This then is the field of precision medicine in MS, a very active uh, area. And the goal would be to identify particular types of lesions predominant in an individual at a given time and to use medications that are more selective and effective against those particular lesion types. And um, just to leave you with this complexity here, we reviewed that um, the injury in the, in the brain of an individual uh, with MS, besides the immune cells, take many different forms, and we need to counter all of this that include inflammation, what are called free radicals, and also microglia activity 
that is driving compartmentalized CNS inflammation. And I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit more about microglia because the field is also making progress in that regard. So microglia is a type of cell type, is a type of cell that is found within the brain and spinal cord. It is an immune cell. It is resident to the brain and spinal cord. It has very important function as any immune cells would. It protects the brain and spinal cord. There are guardians and early responders uh, to injury in the central nervous system. Here we have, uh, let me just see if I can get a video to work. Um, and I'm going to do this. So this is a normal microglia, one cell, another cell here, in the normal uninjured brain and spinal cord. It is an immune cell, it's very active, it is surveying its environment, it is looking for threats, and here a threat has been found. There's an injury here, and these cells are immediately responding and migrating to help to defend against that particular threat and also to help repair that particular area. So they're very useful cells normally in the brain and spinal cord. But what has become clear is that they have been subverted. They have been overactivated in the brain of an individual living with MS. And we see these examples of their intense aggregation. Even in a normal appearing area, they are already aggregating and attempting to um, it's, it's just a not, not a good environment. And then there are these types of lesions in which the microglia is at the rim and pushing the injury outwards to expand the injury. And where these cells are in abundance, these are also areas in which axons are beginning to be disrupted. Nerve fibers are beginning to be disrupted as shown by this uh, particular label. So these are normally very important cells in our brain and spinal cord. Normally, they are defenders and guardians and responders to early injury. But in multiple sclerosis, they seem to be overactivated. And therefore, we have called these protectors turn destroyers. So the field then is very interested in trying to normalize the activity of these microglial cells to bring them back to uh, a baseline level to reduce the uh, activation uh, because when overactivated, those cells are helping to drive injury. These cells can be detected in an individual using a type of scan called positron emission tomography or PET. Uh, and here's a, um, a brain scan a regular MRI, uh, and this area looks quite normal. But at the same time, when a PET scan is done, one is already seeing signs of these microglial cells being activated. And then a month later, a follow-up MRI uh, over here, um, and I'm going to bring the pointer back. Um, and over here, a month later, one sees uh, that lesion forming. So the preceding microglia activation a month later now leads to a lesion that can be detected on regular MRI. Again, emphasizing that these cells seem to have taken on um, a destroyer function where normally they would be protectors. One of the enzyme that is driving the activity of this microglia seems to be this enzyme called Bruton's tyrosine kinase, BTK. So this enzyme on microglia appears to help drive the overactivation of microglia and lesion formation. And here we have captured um, images of these microglia in the brain. 
expressing this enzyme BTK. And here's a three-dimensional rendition, emphasizing that many of these uh, cells have elevated this particular enzyme that seems to be driving their overactivity and undesirable effects. The long and short of that is that there is intense interest in now trying to inhibit the activity of BTK in the brain of an individual with, living with MS. Because by using these BTK inhibitors, one has the potential to bring these cells back to baseline. Um, these cells also affect lymphocytes, which is a bonus as well. Um, and when one now looks into the clinical trials that are ongoing with these BTK inhibitors, here are four inhibitors of BTK. These are the companies that own these medications. Um, there are two trials for each of this ongoing in relapsing remitting MS. And I should emphasize that these are phase three trials. They involve hundreds, if not about a thousand individuals in each of these trials. Um, these are definitive trials, the success of which will lead to the, will hopefully lead the FDA to approve the use of these medications. But these trials are also being, uh, drugs are also being tested in primary progressive MS. Uh, two of these are listed here and one in secondary progressive MS. We hope to see the first of these results the end of next year. But this is 11 phase three trials ongoing in multiple sclerosis. And I cannot think of another field in which there are so many phase three trials ongoing at the same time. This is remarkable. Before I move on to repair of um, the brain and spinal cord in MS, I just want to take a few minutes to, well, uh, use this slide to consider Epstein-Barr virus. Does it cause MS? There was a very uh, authoritative study that came out last year um, showing its association with multiple sclerosis. This was a study that involved uh, the people enrolling in the U.S. Army, where for every individual that is enrolled, there are blood samples that are taken at regular intervals. Um, and these individuals are also followed for general health over the course of years. So this was a study that looked into 10 million personnel enrolled in the U.S. Army, some of them followed for over 20 years. And during this course of 20 years, about a thousand of these succumbed to multiple sclerosis. All of these, except for one individual, had new or previous EBV infections. So basically, of individuals that succumbed to MS, because blood samples were available, all of these were found to be associated with EBV infection, whether previous or new infection. And they, the uh, investigators went on to show in the case of EBV over here to our left, that in individuals that were EBV positive, i.e. they um, had infection, either when they first joined the army, or previously negative, but then became positive with an EBV infection during the course of this study, the odds ratio of developing MS increased by 32-fold. So EBV infection was associated with a very high increase in the odds of succumbing to MS. And here to the right, they showed that this is not the case for all viruses. There is another virus called CMV, and this does not have, does not increase the odds ratio of developing MS. So this has led to a lot of excitement in the field. Is EBV the cause of MS? Should we now eradicate EBV? 
and they are actively ongoing to try to develop vaccines for EBV or drugs to eradicate EBV. Um, but what I want to say is that this does not prove that EBV causes MS. Uh, most of us are infected with EBV. Over 90% of the general population has EBV infection. Many of us don't go on to develop MS. So it by itself is not sufficient to cause MS. And there must be other modifiers. So for now, while this is good data, the field is still out. We are still arguing as to uh, how pivotal EBV is uh, in the course of MS. So what about recovery from MS? And this is the last section of my lecture today. Um, this is the prospect of repairing plaques, lesions that have already formed in the brain and spinal cord. It turns out that the oligodendrocyte that is now missing from this individual with MS or the myelin that is lost can regenerate. So this then is this phenomenon of an oligodendrocyte that can be regenerated and can now reform myelin. And this is called remyelination. Remyelination occurs in individuals with MS but it is very heterogeneous. This is a study that looked into plaques in individuals living with MS. They show us four examples here. This in red are plaques that did not have any evidence of remyelination. So this individual repaired poorly, but these are two individuals in which all the plaques were pretty much remyelinated. So this individual had good capacity to repair. So it varies across individuals, but some individuals can repair very robustly. It occurs in all forms of MS, relapsing remitting to secondary progressive MS, varies across individuals, declines with longevity of MS, and is reduced with age, just like everything else, unfortunately. <clears throat> The importance of remyelination in MS is that it can help restore the conduction of those signals that go from one neuron to the next. More importantly is that the myelin can protect the underlying nerve. The new myelin that is put back on can prevent the underlying nerve from degenerating. And if so, remyelination can help prevent the progression of disability. And of course, we all hope and aim towards remyelination recovering functions. So this slide emphasizes that remyelination protects the axon or nerve fiber that has lost its myelin. Here is um, an oligodendrocyte. It's destroyed, and so the myelin is now loss, these wrappings, and with remyelination, the fate of the underlying nerve fiber is one of survival. This has been shown in experimental models very conclusively. If remyelination is prevented, the fate of that underlying nerve fiber is one of degeneration. So at least for many of us, we want to remyelinate because at the very least, we can help protect underlying, underlying nerves and prevent progression of disability. And for some of us, we would like to recover function. Can we recover function? Well, we don't have that data just yet, but here's another study out of Paris using positron emission tomography, PET scanning, that can detect remyelination. And what they show is that in individuals that remyelinated very well by uh, uh, through PET scanning studies, these individuals tend to have very low EDSS disability score. So the better the capacity to repair, the better uh, uh, 
this status of an individual is the less likelihood of progression, uh, emphasizing to us that remyelination uh, is important to prevent disability and hopefully can also restore function. The restoration of function is shown in experimental models. Here's a study actually in cats, and we apologize for the use of animals in research. This is a study uh, from the University of Wisconsin in which the optic nerve of cats were demyelinated. So these uh, cats could not see, they could not react to a menace um, reflex. But when remyelination occurred, these animals recovered sight and were able now to adjust. Uh, and, um, and this is therefore recovery of function. Um, I will tell you that um, restoration is a very important theme in the world of MS. It's a very active area, but let me introduce you to this roadmap of pathways to cures. This is an initiative of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society of the United States. And it is also, um, uh, and MS Canada is very much a part of this. So the idea of pathways to cures, and cures is in plural, because a cure means, diff, uh, well, it means different things to different individuals. For an individual that has stabilization of disability, that could be a cure. Prevention of MS, that is a cure. Recovery, that is a cure. So a cure means different things for different individuals. But here's the road, road map. So we recognize that there is a prodromal period, uh, subclinical, no signs of MS yet, and then symptoms appear, and then sim uh, symptoms uh, worsen. Um, so one pathway is to stop this progression. Another pathway is to end, if we can recognize the early signs of possible MS early enough. And then this is the restore pathway um, of uh, recovery of functions. At uh, this year in New York City in early May, there is a global meeting around these pathways to cures. All the international organization, national organizations, as well as international MS organizations were at this meeting. Uh, I had the uh, privilege of chairing the session on restore and introducing concepts of restore to the audience for discussion. And I want to show you four slides that I use to summarize key developments in the past five years on repair and recovery and where we would need to go from here. So here's the first slide that I, uh, one of the first slides that I want to show, share with you. So one of the key developments is better understanding of what challenges the oligodendrocytes from repairing within a lesion and therefore why remyelination fails in some individuals. Um, and one of the reasons remyelination fails is because the plaque itself, the lesion environment, is actually very, very hostile to repair. And it contains inhibitors, one of which we have identified that makes the lesion a very poor reparative lesion compared to one that is robustly repairing. And these are oligodendrocytes. Yet another key development in the past five years is that there are many drugs that can stimulate oligodendrocytes, some of which have transitioned into clinical trials. And here's a listing of a number of these medications and how they work on the oligodendrocyte to improve its potential for repair. And here's another key development that indeed in the past five years, there are many clinical trials for remyelination that are ongoing. Uh, some of these um, are listed here. Some of these are referred to as small molecule agonists 
or antagonist to various receptors. Some of these are metabolic modulators, um, et cetera. These are the listing of the drugs um, and the phase clinical trial phases that they are in um, and their registration in clinicaltrials.gov, all of which to give you an idea that there are many clinical trials for remyelination that are ongoing. Yet another key development is if you have repair ongoing in the brain, how can you measure that? How can you objectively tell an individual that their brain is repairing? Um, and in this regard, MRI and various types of MRI, as well as positron emission tomography, PET scanning that I told you about, are, are, are all being rapidly moved towards uh, clinical application in order to measure objectively repair that is occurring. And I should acknowledge here that one of my colleagues at the University of Calgary, Dr. Zhang, uh, is an expert in a type of AI uh, indi indicator of uh, remyelination in lesions. Yet another uh, key development is the recognition that lifestyle factors regulate repair. This is all work in preclinical models at this point, but diet, certain types of diet, intermittent fasting, social isolation that impairs, that inhibits, um, and exercise that promote um, remyelination. These are all lifestyles that promote uh, remyelination. And here in this preclinical pre study, we were able to show that in mice following an MS-like lesion to the spinal cord, when these mice uh, were allowed to exercise versus those that were not uh, allowed to, the, their lesions repaired better. They had more remyelination in their spinal cord. And certainly in the clinic, um, exercise has benefits for the brain as shown by a number of MRI type studies uh, and also on, of studies that look at connectivity of the brain. Along with that is an understanding of how exercise may be benefiting the brain. So for instance, the skeletal muscle is actually producing a lot of molecules following when exercising that circulates in the bloodstream. Here are some of these molecules. They can cross the blood-brain barrier to enter into the brain to help with uh, well-being of cells of the brain. So they are actual mechanisms, biological mechanisms um, that one can invoke in terms of exercise-induced benefits for the brain. And with that, there is an expert group um, that have recommended 150 minutes a week of some form of physical activity. Um, and again, exercise is good for the brain. So the overall summary for the restore part that I had the privilege of sharing in the pathways to cures is that remyelination occurs in MS. Discovering repair medication is an active research area, some of which are already <clears throat> in clinical trials that lifestyle factors such as exercise can confer benefits to the brain, including in brain repair. And I always uh, would like to encourage everyone to stay active. So here is my penultimate slide then. Uh, there are a lot of progress uh, that is occurring in the world of MS. We have new insights on the types of lesions and how they drive progression, that different individuals have different spectrum of lesions that we need to pay attention to in the context of precision medicine. We have many medications for relapsing remitting MS. We have medications that are increasingly becoming available for progressive MS. Steps towards precision medicine are being made. 
there is the potential of repair medications coming down the pipeline that lifestyle factors can help with promoting repair. And also this phenomenon of positive thinking. I was at a meeting in Quebec City just last week in which a researcher from Israel, a leader in the field, was explaining her findings on how positive thinking actually triggers biological mechanisms to affect the immune system. So by staying positive and hopeful, you know, I think that that can help uh, with most of our ailments, if not MS. And with that, I thank you for your attention.